Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. It's Friday. It's Friday. No, tomorrow is Monday. <laughs> tomorrow is Monday? It's not Monday. Oh. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, so last time we were talking about, we had begun talking about uh, identities. So, what is the additive identity? It's zero. And why is zero the additive identity? Right, because it's the number such that adding this number is the same as doing nothing. Okay. Uh, what is the multiplicative identity? One, because multiplying by one is the same <coughs> as doing nothing. Okay, so then, <coughs> uh, here's, a, here's a strange question. Verify that three and negative three are additive inverses. Well, how do you do that? <laughs> Add them together. What do you get when you do that? Zero. You get zero. And what what notable thing is true about zero? It's the additive identity. So this is the reason why three and three are additive inverses, is because when you add them, you get the additive identity. OK. <clears throat> Verify that two-thirds and three-halves are multiplicative inverses. Well, how do you do that? Yeah. Not quite. <laughs> oh, I mean, multiply. Right. <laughs> so we'll multiply them together. And what do you get when you do that? One. One and why is that notable? Right. So to, ve to verify that two-thirds and three-halves are multiplicative inverses, you multiply them and check and see if you get the multiplicative identity. Okay? So, <clears throat> so uh, we've got these operations add and subtract. Uh, you can do these things with numbers. You can do add and subtract with functions also. But what's the thing you can do with functions that you can't do with numbers? Pushing for a C word. Starts with C. <laughs> <laughs> Ends with. Compose. 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 Ah, that's it. That's it. Compose. Okay. So, so, just like just like we said, three and negative three are additive inverses because when you add them, you get the additive identity, and. Two thirds and three halves are multiplicative inverses because when you multiply them, you get the multiplicative identity. Now we're going to need to do, we want to have the exact same phraseology but for with composition. We want to take two functions and ask, are these two functions compositional inverses? And in order to confirm or deny that, we'll have to compose them and see if we get the compositional identity. Does everybody get the structure? Yes. Okay. Good. <clears throat> well, when you're when you're teaching, besides having the besides teaching the right thing, the first rule uh, for teaching effectively is repetition. The second rule for teaching effectively is repetition. Right. <laughs> Good. Uh, so this is the uh, the identity, the compositional identity.
identity is written ID. And to, to remind you, uh, when I'm writing en English words, I write it in block print. And then when I'm writing math stuff, I write it in script. So that's ID, lowercase ID. Its formula is this, ID of x is x. So it's a, it's a function that where you give it an x and it just immediately gives it right back to you. So uh, written in sort of the machine style, where you say uh, this, this thing, we'll call it ID. Suppose that you put an x in and then what comes out? An X. So in the in the analogy of machines and assembly lines and things like this, ID of X is like a bit of conveyor belt. It just just moves it moves the the argument down the line. So please observe the following. Uh, what it let's do F composed with ID evaluated at x. Well, how do we write this without the composition operator? So it's the, the way this is defined. It would be <coughs> f of what? id of x. So that's what it means to do that. But then what's the formula for ID of x? <coughs> ID of x is x. So this is just f of x. So what I want you to see, what I want you to see is that composing f with ID was the same as not doing it. And it was just like we didn't didn't do it at all. Then what if we do it on the left side? ID of F, ID composed with F evaluated at X. Well, how do we write this without um, without the composition operator? Similarly, right? So this would be ID of f of x. But what is id of f of x? It's f of x, right? Because id is the machine that whatever you put in, that's what comes back out. So you put an x in, an x comes out. You put a 5 in, 5 comes out. You put a banana in, banana comes out. If you put a f of x in, then f of x is what comes out. So what I'm telling you is that composing with the identity function on the right is, is the same as not doing that. And composing with, with the identity function but with the identity on the left is the same as not doing it also. So that's why it's the identity function. And then written as machines, you could say, well, let's say that this is ID first and we give X to the ID machine and then what comes out? x comes out. And then suppose we give that to f, and then what comes out? f of x. Right? So that means that, you know, if, if it was just this machine, it would be, you know, it would be just be the f machine. But then putting this id in front of it, this is just like a little strip of conveyor belt. Just go straight through. Uh, and if you do them in the other order, So what goes right here? Not x. F of x, right? You put x into the f machine, and then f of x comes out. And suppose you put f of x into the id machine, what comes out? f of x. OK, so this is the identity. So uh, in, in particular, it's the compositional identity. So the identity of addition is 0. The identity of multiplication is one and the identity of composition is ID. That's its name.
So, <clears throat> here's the question. Verify. Verify uh, that f of x equal to the cube root of x plus 4 and g of x equal to <coughs> x cubed minus 4 are compositional inverses. So what, what must we do? Right, we need to compose them. That'd be the only way. Okay, so f composed with g evaluated at x. So then how do we write that without the composition operator? Very good, f of g of x. So, so I'm being met with a little bit of silence. Is that because this is too obvious or too subtle? Is it? I'm not sure where. I'm trying to read the crowd, but I'm getting just stone, stone faces. <laughs> <laughs> it, this is okay. 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 So then let's let's. Uh, well, what does F do to its argument? So currently, well, I'll just obscure what its argument is. Notice that what F does is it takes if you if you call its argument x, it does cube root of, of x plus four. That's what it does. So whatever it is that I'm obscuring, I need to do I need to add four to it and then compute cube root of all of it. So doing f would make it look like this. Okay, then now we can plug in what G does. G does x cubed minus 4. Okay. So, so what? What can we do here? Uh, what do you mean distribute? Yeah, we could deal with the fours, right? We could, admit, you might mean deassociate, remove the parentheses. Uh, so you could, you could remove the parentheses and then say, oh, well, the fours, they, they can be, uh, they cancel each other. Okay, now what? They do cancel each other. You're left with x. But, and here's the thing, what's another way to write x? Well, what, what is a machine that if you were to put an x in, the x would come right back out the output side? ID. So what I'd like for you to observe is that f composed with g is, the, is ID of x. I'd also like to point out something that's kind of funny. Uh, that you get to this this point, and it, and it kind of looks a little bit complicated about what, what you're doing with that x, because you're saying, okay, I want you to take an x, and the first thing I want you to do is cube it, and then after you've done that, subtract 4. And remember that, because now I want you to add 4 and then compute com cube root of the result, which is altogether a fancy way to say, I want you to take the x and do nothing. Do nothing with that x. Just, <laughs> just pass it right down the line. So this, this, is, this is altogether a fancy way to say, do nothing loudly. Okay. <clears throat> like you've put the X into the machine, you hear all kinds of saws and hammers and cats screaming and, you know, everything is occurring in there, and then the X just comes right out on the other side and it was, it was the same thing you put in. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, 
does this mean that does this mean that f and g are inverses? Because let's think when we wanted to when we wanted to verify that two numbers were additive inverses, we added them and checked and see if we got the additive identity. So we wanted to check and see if these were compositional inverses, so we composed them and checked and see if we got the compositional identity. So does that mean that they're inverses? And the answer is no. <laughs> it means that we're <laughs> it means that we're halfway done. It means that we're halfway done because F composed with G, that's just half the story. What's the other half of the story? G composed with F. Now, notably, if you have two numbers, if I give you two numbers, A and B, if you add them together and get the additive identity, you don't need to do it the other way. Why not? Be because A plus B is the same as B plus A. And what's the name of that? word. Commutative. Addition commutes. Does composition commute? No. Composition does not commute. It doesn't commute. It's, it's the same as asking if you have machines in an, in an assembly line, does it really matter what order those machines are in? It sure does, right? Because remember we did the doll example. And if you have if you're if you put underwear on first and then pants then it's like a Ken doll whereas if you do pants first and then underwear it's a Superman doll does the order of the machines matter yes. sure sure it does so that's why when you're checking inverses you have to check both orders okay so G evaluated at f of x So what does G do, do to its argument? It cubes it and then subtracts 4. So this would be f of x cubed and then minus 4. Any question getting to there? And then now we can substitute in uh, what f does. Okay, so now this is again on the exact same line, a loud way we suspect of saying do nothing, <laughs> right? So, so what can we do? Right, the cube root and the cube, they cancel. So this would be x plus 4 and then minus 4. And then what? Cancel the 4s so that that's x, but... What's another way to write x? ID of x. So what we're saying is that g composed with f is the identity function. So what's the conclusion about whether or not they're inver they are inverses? They are. Any question about this one? <clears throat> yes? Why was it given the name ID? Because yeah. those are the first two letters of identity. No, that's, that's, that's the only reason <clears throat> that I'm aware of. Okay, let's try it again. But now that the, now that the, 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 the story is, is better known, let's, let's try this. How about uh, confirm, deny that uh, uh, w of x equal to 3 square root x minus 5 and v of x equal to x over 3 squared plus 5 
are compositional inverses. Okay. So, um, I'm going to do V of W, V composed with W first. So we're all in agreement that, that to answer this question, we have to do the composition, right? I'm going to do V composed with W first. <clears throat> So that would be uh, w of x over 3, and then square that, add 5. Okay, then I'll substitute in what w does now. So this will be 3 square root x minus 5, and then that over 3 all that squared and then add 5. Okay, now what? Cancel the 3's. Now what? Okay, cancel the square and the square root. Cancel the fives. You get x, which is, of course, id of x. <clears throat> OK, so it's looking good, maybe. Or at least, you know, if we're going to confirm or deny uh, that, they're re that they really are inverses. What column does this go in? Confirm, right? So, so far, anyway. Uh, but, but to finish the confirmation or denial. What else do we need to do? Uh huh. We need to do it in the other order. W composed with V evaluated at X. Okay, well, that would be W of V of X. And then that's what those things do. So that would be 3 square root v of x uh, minus 5. <coughs> and then this would be uh, 3, 3 multiplied by uh, square root of x over 3 squared plus 5 minus 5. OK, now what? <laughs> the fives, OK. So that'd be 3 multiplied by the square root of, we get, we cancel the fives and get x over 3 squared. Now what? So it sounds like what y'all are saying is I should write this. But that's not right. That's wrong. Why is that not right? I'm, I, I'm claiming that this is not right, and it, and it isn't. Uh, that, the 3 doesn't make any difference, right? So I could say that this is x squared over 9, and then that'd be a 9 in the denominator. Then I could factor it out, and it would cancel with that 3. So these 3s, these they're just along for the ride. And you know, it kind of looks like the analogous place we are is right here. So right here, we said 
the cube root of x cubed is x. And that's a fact. And if you squint your eyes and just, if I say that what's under there is a y, then, then is it true that the, that the square root of y squared is y? It is not true. The square root of y squared is not y. What's the square root of y squared? Vision for, vision for an A word. Which one? Absolute value. Ah, absolute value. Coming up. Ah, those absolute value bars cannot be forgotten. The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. Now, you can factor this 3 out and cancel that 3 with that other 3, and, and you can get to here, absolute value of x. So is that id of x? It is not. So what's the conclusion about whether or not functions w and v are compositional inverses? They are not. Okay, now for those of you that are still stuck <laughs> on that, on this step right here, I'll remind you that the nth root of x to exponent n is x when n is odd, and it is absolute value of x when n is even. So this is something that's been a facet of our class since the beginning. <clears throat> so it worked. It worked on this one. Why? Because 3 is odd. It didn't work on this one because 2 is even. So in, so in a real sense, you could kind of say, oh, well, he set us up. Yeah, I did. <laughs> to, make, to, to make a point, to bring this point out. So, um, well, <clears throat> Because of this one, because of this computation, because v composed with w is the identity function, but this is not something that we say in our class, but it helps. This is not something that's going to be tested in our class anyway, but it helps to understand what this means. This means that, v, that v is, <laughs> is a post inverse of w, or sometimes some books call it a left inverse because you're writing v on the left. And w is a pre inverse of v, uh, or sometimes a right inverse of v. So what I want you to see is that even though v is a left inverse, a post inverse, it's not a pre inverse of w. And I claim that this makes perfect sense because, for example, tonight you might uh, go home and have a nice quiet evening at home and prepare yourself a dinner and then afterward clean up the kitchen and then the state of the kitchen before and after this whole process is unchanged, right? So you, you did, in, in a sense, a, a long, complicated way to achieve nothing in your kitchen, right? As, long as, as, as far as your kitchen's status is concerned. And you, first, you first make a mess in the process of, of making dinner, and then you clean up the mess. That makes sense. Can you reverse the order of those steps? Can you say, you know what? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do the dishes now before I've made dinner. No, you can't, right? It doesn't make any sense. So it makes, it makes perfect sense that, that some processes can be inverses, but only after. They can be inverse to each other, but only in a certain order. Okay, same thing here. <clears throat> okay, so now, which numbers have an additive inverse? Which of, which of them do? So like 3, does 3 have an additive inverse? Negative 3. Okay, how about uh, negative 10? Does it have an additive inverse? 
10, okay. How about uh, 0? Okay, 0 is its additive inverse. So which numbers have an additive inverse? All of them do, right? All of them do. Uh, which numbers have a multiplicative inverse? Any, anything that's not 0. So now suddenly, suddenly multiplication is more complicated than addition. Not everything can have a multiplicative inverse. Every non-zero number can have a multiplicative inverse. Uh, then, uh, so the test for whether or not a number has an additive inverse is just, is just, it does, right? You don't even need to test anything. Are you a number? You have an additive inverse. The test for whether or not a number has a multiplicative inverse is checking whether or not it's zero. All non-zero numbers have a multiplicative inverse. So now what we need to do is we need to figure out which functions will have a compositional inverse, because not all of them will. So for example, the one that we did on the previous page, this one, w, does have a compositional inverse, and v, in fact, does not. Now we haven't said why, I'm just telling you that, 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 that I'm stating facts for you. This one does have a compositional inverse, and this one doesn't. So let's see what the condition is. So what we're trying to address right now is, w is when does a function have a compositional inverse? OK. To answer this question, take us back down memory lane and draw one of these arrow functions. <coughs> okay. So here we have an, one of these arrow defined functions. And suppose that you're over here. Uh, and suppose, furthermore, that you witness a 4 come out the output side of the machine. If you see a 4 come out of the output side of the machine, it, and, and supposing, furthermore, that you know exactly the way this machine works on the inside, supposing you witness a 4 come out, would you know for sure what was put in? Yes you would know for sure. It could only have been what? A two. A two. Okay, now, uh, suppose you're on the output side and you witness a five come out. Would you know for sure what was put in? No. You would not know. You would not know, so that means that there isn't a machine that I could put after this one, that I could put after this one, that would, that would, be, able, that would be able to know what if it sees a 5, whether or not it should output a 1 or a 3. It wouldn't know. So this, this machine is not invertible. But we already had an I word for this. Wasn't, what, what, is, what, is the, what is the I word that I'm fishing for? In particular, this function is not some I word. Which one? Injective. This function is not injective. and therefore not invertible. And in particular, these two things are synonyms. So, for example, suppose we draw an injective function. So, uh, injective, that's kind of a fancy sounding word. Would someone please uh, remind us what, what the definition of injectivity is? What's the definition? That's the definition of a function. Now you need to switch those two. <laughs> Each output has exactly one input. 
which is to say that if you look at the outputs, there's only one arrow hitting each one of them. So is that true for all these? No, no. no it's not true for five. That's why this one's not injective. So let's draw one that is injective. Okay, so now notice that this one is different. Suppose you witness a four come out. Would you know for sure what was put in? Yes. There could be only one thing. Do you also observe that for every conceivable output, you know exactly what input produced it? That means that you could make another machine uh, that, that is exactly this one, but we just turn the arrows around. Okay. So, <clears throat> in particular, I'd like for you to so, so have a look at this one. So suppose we have this machine. One, two, three, and then I'm just copying this one. Four, five, six. So just copying this one. One went to six. Two went to four. And three went to five. And now let's say that I use these outputs as, in, as input to the next phase of the machine. And now I'm going to do the opposite here. I'm going to say, OK, if I'm over here and I see the 4 come in, I'll push the 4 back in, and then what will come out on the other side? A 2. So the 4 should go to the 2. Suppose we witness a 5 come out. Uh, on this side, and then we push the five back in, what would pop out on the other side? A three. So the five should go to the three. And finally, suppose we're over here and we witness a six come out, and then we push the six back in, what would pop out on the other side? A one. So now what I want you to do is look at the way this, this machine works, this composed machine works. Suppose we put, just for sake of argument, suppose we put a 1 in. Well, now you just follow the bouncing ball. 1 goes to 6, goes to 1. So 1 goes in, 1 comes out. And this is the same for all inputs. And, and this, this, is a, this is, if you like, a noisy way to do nothing. Right? So this is the identity. So when does a function have a compositional inverse? When it's injective. Now, uh, in the case of uh, x, y plots, which we love to do with, with uh, functions when we're drawing them, we already know a test for injectivity. And because injectivity is the same thing as, uh, as inverseness, I'm not sure what the adjective is there. That means that because you know a test for injectivity, you, alre you already know a test to see whether or not something is invertible. What is the test for whether or not a function is injective? Which one? The horizontal line test. So that means that visually you can now tell at a glance whether or not a function has, has uh, an inverse. So how about, uh, here's an example. Here's an example. And here's an example. OK. So the question is, uh, for each one, do, does it represent an injective function? So is this an injective function? And, and therefore, is it invertible? The answer is no. Why is the answer no? Well, consider that output right there. 
That because that's because that's on the x-axis. That output is zero, but so is this, and so is that. So that input makes output zero. That input makes output zero. That input makes output zero. And if you were standing on the output side of the machine and you witnessed a zero come out, you wouldn't know what was put in. That one, that one, or that one. So this is not invertible. What about this one? Is this one invertible? It is because you can imagine a horizontal line and moving it up and down. Do you observe that there's always going to be zero or one intersections? So this one is not invertible. This one uh, is, is invertible. How about the last one? No. no. Ah, right? <laughs> This is not a function, so it's surely not invertible. So, so it, the question is whether or not we're looking at an invertible function. So the one on the right is, is surely the answer is no, in the same sense that uh, don't you love my lovely green apple here? <laughs> yeah, right. And then, you know, for those of you who haven't caught the joke yet, I'll say it again. Right. You might say, oh, that's not a green apple, to which I respond, oh, it's clearly green. But then what, what's my mistake? It's green, but it's not an apple. It's, it's not in the first place an apple, right? So is this, is this an invertible function? No, because it is not in the first place a function. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay. <clears throat> so, I have a question for you. Here is a function. Okay. So this function that I drew, well, in the first place, is what I drew a function? Yes. yes. Is what I drew an invertible function? Yes. Yes. It's a function because it passes the vertical line test. It's an invertible function because it passes the horizontal line test. So here's another function. Well, let me ask, is what I drew a function? Yes. Yes. Is what I drew an invertible function? No, it's not. Now, this, to me, to my eye anyway, so ignoring this one for a moment, uh, of the family of functions that we know, remember that, sh that page where we said, here's these ones, here's those ones, here's those ones. What does this one look most like? Square root, Square root but moved around a bit right? Moved around a bit. So uh, if, I were, if I was to say, if I was to say, can I do it right? Yeah, good. If I was to say that this is the point 5, 0, then that would mean that we took the square root and moved it over to the right 5 units. Okay. So that would mean that we'd have to change x to, in the, for square root of x, we'd have to change x to what? To cause that transformation. X minus 5, right? Because what we'd be doing is we'd be taking the normal square root and then pulling the coordinate system to the left 5 units. So, and if I say that that's a little bit taller, that would mean I made a vertical scale, and it might not be unreasonable to say that this is 3, the square, three multiplied by square root of x minus 5. if that would cause it to shift over and also to be vertically scaled a little bit. Now, this, of, of all the family of functions, looks most like what? Looks most like x squared, like parabola. Uh, but it's been shifted up a bit. And if you carefully walk your way through those, then um, you might agree that it looks like this. g of x is x cubed uh, sorry, x over 3 all squared and then add 5. 
But wait a second. Don't you remember these functions from a couple pages ago? They were exactly these. Uh, but I said F and G. Darn. <laughs> they were W and V from, from two pages ago. Uh, so this one was so this one was V. So how about it? Is this one invertible? It isn't. Why is it not invertible? Because it fails the horizontal line test. So of course, now in retrospect, you could have predicted that this this had something like this had to occur. Something like this must occur, according to that uh, information. Very interesting. Okay. So the last thing that we can introduce. <clears throat> so cons considering a plot like that, this this function is invertible. So now let's ignore this other one for a moment and just look at this one. This one is invertible because because it passes the it is a function which passes the horizontal line test. So let's consider just drawing it here. If that's the point 5 0 then what we're saying is that this red function is a function that when you input 5, what is the output? 0. If you plug in a 5, a 0 comes out on the output side. So the inverse function, because you know that for, for the original function, when you input 5, 0 is output, you also know a, a point on the inverse function. What point? Not the same one. You got to turn the machine around. Imagine standing on either side of the machine. Someone puts a five in, and you witness a zero come out. So you should be able to push the zero back in and watch a five come back out. So if five zero is one of is on this one, what's on the inverse one? Zero five. So if that point is on the original, then this one is on the inverse. Furthermore, suppose that, say, <clears throat> this one, suppose that AB is on the original function. That is to say, when you put an A in, you witness a B come out, then what should be on the inverse? B A. You should be able to push that B back in and watch the A come out the other side. And what I want you to observe about this is that we could do this one point, one point, one point at a time, and that's going to end up being exactly the same thing as drawing this line and reflecting the red across it and making a symmetric graph on the other side. This is what the inverse function looks like. Symmetric across, what's the equation for this line with slope one through the origin? Y is X. So now, what I am trying to get you to see and think about over the weekend is that any time the point AB is on the original function, the point BA is on the inverse. And that makes complete sense because, because what you're doing is you're turning the machine around. If A becomes B, then in the inverse machine, B becomes A. So you can always transpose the points. And then they end up looking like violins to me. <laughs> kind of abstract violin-shaped thing. OK, have a nice weekend.